Okay. So we're back again. So we concluded chapter five with vision, but I want to make sure we understand vision and hearing. In this chapter, we're dealing with also mechanical and chemical senses. We're just dealing with how the body is detecting uh, outside energy. For anatomy uh, components, let me describe this real quick about vision as we then move on to talk about hearing. So for review, again, the retina is the place where the actual image is shown on. So here's the light, here's the eyeball. If light is shining through the eyeball, it must hit the back of the retina. If you blow the retina up, that's what it looks like. The light shines all the way through here. We talked about the back layer being pigmented. If it's not pigmented, you have a problem. The photoreceptors are embedded in the pigment layer. These rising cones then talk to these multiple other cells. We talked about macro cells, ganglion cells, macro ganglion, horizontal cells, bipolar. All these are processing the vision. And then it goes this way to the optic nerve. Now, that's the back of the eye. So the back of the eye has these receptors, rising cones, and they're detecting those different wavelengths of light. So the back of the eye is doing that. However, you now have to have further processing going to the brain. This is the part that I'll emphasize here because it kind of relates to the hearing also. So what we have is two eyeballs, optic nerve. They cross at a place called the optic chiasm. They cross at a place called the optic chiasm. Information on the outside of the eyeball, temporal, goes to the same side of the brain. Information on the inside of the eyeball, crosses, goes to the opposite side of the brain. So over here, left side, temporal, which stay on this side of the brain. Inside of the eyeball, the cross goes to the other side of the brain. That's why we have binocular vision. You can see the whole brain because our eyes go to what? Both sides of the brain. So this has white, it says green. It's showing you that this is white and green. It goes to what? Both sides of the brain. Anatomically speaking, this chiasm is dead in the center of the brain around a place like where the hypothalamus is. Also around the hypo, hypo, below the hypothalamus, Thalamus. Thalamus. So in your notes, if you can remember the medial geniculate thal thalamus, medial geniculate, you'll see it in there in the book. Also, lateral geniculate. So the lateral geniculate relates to vision. The medial geniculate relates to hearing. I say this because we talked about this before, but in the midbrain, there's a place called the uh, tegmentum, the roof of the midbrain. The floor is the tegmentum, the roof is the tectum. There's two little bumps that are on the top of the tectum. One is called the superior colliculus, one is called the inferior colliculus. The superior colliculus relates to vision. The inferior colliculus relates to hearing. It's this is adding further processing. Now we haven't even gotten back to the cortex yet where information is really being detected. All this is just further processing. So if you think about these areas in the thalamus and the midbrain, the colliculi, we're talking about like if you see a bird flying, you have to keep it in orientation. So those cells help to do that. If you hear a sound, where did that come from? Over there, back there. Those cells help to process those stimuli. So that's why it's not just the cortex itself. Right here would be for vision. Over here would be for hearing. But you have cells that are inside the brain that do the further processing. I thought it was important to kind of share that because again, as we now deal with it. Here, we're dealing with different anatomy. The eyeball and receptors in the retina. But 
except it's deep there that here. So, chapter six are the cysts. Other central systems. The first one we're talking about is hearing. Or so, hearing deals with audition. So, you can't, well, you can exist without having hearing because there's some people that are deaf and they communicate by sign language, but hearing is really keeping us in tune with what's going on in our environment, just like all other senses of our So the set, the, the physical stimuli for hearing would be not photons, but sound waves, vibrations. Sound waves, vibrations. How is it measured? By frequency and amplitude. That's how sound waves can be measured. So frequency, how many? Amplitude, how big? Frequency, how many? Amplitude, how big is the wave? So you can take a tuning fork, has vibrations and detects. It can set out some compressions in the, in the environment, vibrations, and that can be detected and measured. So one cycle, you have multiple cycles to measure sound, but here's one cycle. Here you have one, two, or pretty much just one cycle in that one little area. You could have a bunch of cycles in there, and that would be a a lot going on, so that'd be a higher frequency. So you have not as many, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, so not as many, so the frequency is lower. That's why it's a lower frequency here, higher frequency here. When we talk about the uh, amplitude, we're speaking about the size of the wave. So here we say right here, a higher amplitude was Bigger wave. Now here, smaller amplitude is what? Smaller wave. So amplitude and frequency become very important for measurement. So how do you measure? So frequency, if it's rate, rate or cycles per second is measured in hertz. So frequency, cycles per second measured in hertz. Amplitude, loudness, intensity is measured in decibels. Decibels. So hertz, cycles per second, amplitude, decibels. And here's again showing you what I have uh, another figure about low frequency, so it's not as many. Here, high frequency, a lot of that. Here, low amplitude is a smaller wave. Here, high amplitude is what? Bigger wave. So, it mentions there's some other ways you can look at the way sound operates. It talks about a pitch, high pitch, a loudness, timbre, uh, some of it's called prosody, where you're talking about how a person's expression, how they say it, can have a different meaning. So, for the ear, totally different construction than the eyeball. So, when you break down the ear, think of the outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. So outer ear, middle ear, inner ear. So the outer ear pretty much is this cartilage sits here on the outside called the pinna, P-I-N-N-A. It helps to funnel sound, even though we can't really move our ears. But there are other animals like rabbits, dogs, cats that can kind of find that sound and their ears may perk up to what help resonate that sound like a and then the column inside, external 
canal that then helps to centralize the sound waves that are out here to go to the middle here. So this column right here can build up with some wax. It be problematic, can't hear right. Also, sometimes your ears can be clogged and you swallow to try to get that sound out. So interestingly, you see there's another tube right here that goes down. This feeds into the mouth area. It's called a eustachian tube. So if this thing gets clogged up, it can probably cause some problem like earaches. Right here, you see bone around the ear. It's the cranium, hard part of the head. Well, if the soft tissue around that, bone doesn't move. If the soft tissue is now uh, impinging upon that bone, because there's an infection in there, swelling, mucus, ah, earache. So sometimes that ear has to be drained for that fluid to go out so the person has an earache. So fluid becomes very uh, problematic on the issue here, but there's fluid there and further on that becomes important to how the ear works. So again, outer ear, the pinna, now, and leads to the middle ear. The middle ear, the middle ear drum, drum, mm. tympanic membrane, that's another name for it. You know about big orchestras, timpani drums, that's where the name is coming from. Tympanic membrane, it must vibrate, it moves, so the sound goes through the collar, makes the, makes the uh, membrane move, and the membrane move then is connected to some bones, smallest bones in the body. The called malleus, incus, and the stapes. That's the technical name. Or you say the hammer, anvil, and the stirrup. So the malleus, incus, and the stapes are the three small bones, also called the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. I think they're what hammer is like. That's why the first one is like a hammer hitting on something. Perhaps you don't know, but an anvil is something that, like a little, uh, a perfect person makes swords. Uh, they, make, they have to get the metal and they bang on the metal to make that long sword or the banging on an anvil. So that's what's happening with that hammer, banging on the anvil. And then the stir is just the shape of like what's going on with the, uh, what do you call it? The, you put your foot on and ride a horse. Stir. So let me show you uh, an image in a model that can help you to see that also. So in the same model that you see there, right there, ear, external canal, drum, this vibrates, makes these bones move. And then you go to the inner ear, but we've only gotten right now into the outer and middle ear. So we'll think about the bones. So these bones are the smallest bones in the body. They help to reduce that loud sound coming from the outside of the ear. So that doesn't bust your eardrum. Don't have that eardrum busted. If you do, you got a problem. So the shapes of these bones are why they're called those particular names: hammer, anvil, and stir. So as we then go beyond the middle ear bones, the one bone called stir talks to the cochlea. That's now in the inner ear. Stirrup talks to the cochlea. This thing right here is like a snail. Inside the snail is fluid. So if we, if we extended the snail and rolled it out, it would have like a long uh, canal inside of it. If you wrap it up, it's like what a snail looks like. A snail. This right here is the nerve that goes to the brain, cranial nerve eight, the vestibulocochlear nerve. 
granular eight. So the inside here is where the actual cells are for here. So now I'm moving in with what we're trying to hear from the outside world. Sound waves, hit the drum, drum moves, makes the bones move, takes the touch of the oval window, the oval window. So it's like if you open up a door in a house or somewhere, that oval window is like a door. Inside the fluid then moves. Now on the bottom of the, the inside of that copia, it's called the basilar membrane. So outside here, drum, bones, all that blue means fluid. On the bottom part of the copia is the basilar membrane. We see those stripes. Those stripes are really hair cells. So hair cells sit on the basilar membrane. Basilar membrane, hair cells sit on it. Above the hair cells is another membrane called the tectorial membrane. Tectorial membrane. It's in purple in this image here. Basal membrane, like gray, purple, tectorial, in between that, hair cells. When those hair cells move, they fire and they cause the information that goes to the nerve that then goes to the brain. So this purple image right here, that is the nerve going to the brain. So the hair cells are firing and then they get connected to the, the nerve that then goes to the brain, temporal lobe area for processing here. Those nerves also talk to the uh, another part of the copia. We have these like little canals. One, two, three. These canals are called semicircular canals. And at the base of the canals are more structures we'll see in the next topic of discussion on balance. But this is where your balance mechanisms are, like your vestibular mechanisms. That's why cranial nerve 8 is called the vestibular cochlear nerve. So the nerve that's the steel hearing also is in balance. So when you read through the slides here, it'll explain it to you. I don't have time to read it all and read it on your own. Explain what I just try to describe for you. Same images, outer ear, middle ear with the bones. Here's the cochlea, it's split in half. Look inside, so it's like a column. You got these three little layers, one called scala vestibuli, one scala media, scala tympani. Don't worry about all that. Just remember that the, in the middle is the basal membrane sitting on it. Take this and blow it up again, right here. You blow it up, you see this basal membrane on the bottom, but the hair cells sit up, pectoral membranes above. So it's like a shearing force. As hair cells move, they fire along the nerve and you're hearing certain sounds. So if we take an electromicrograph image of the layer, you see these little things right here, those are hair cells. Those hair cells are laid out in a certain way to pick up certain kinds of frequencies of sound. It's called tonal topic. I think tonal topic relates to how it is in the brain how it's really going from the ear to the brain in terms of certain sounds in certain areas of the brain. But the hair cells are laid out on the, on the basal membrane in a certain kind of a pattern. So there are theories as to how we hear. It doesn't say it here on your PowerPoint. Yeah, it does say it right here. One is called the place theory, one's called the frequency theory. 
Make a place area like a piano. If you ever play the piano, you get keys on the piano. Black, white, keys all along the board. Each one of those keys has a different sound. Each one of those keys has a string that creates a different sound. So when you press the key, different sound. So people are saying the same thing to be on the base of membrane where different sounds depending on where it is on that membrane. But some of the cells are too close together where it may not work. So the theory is maybe not as tight as it should be. The other one's a frequency theory, meaning that depending on how high the frequency is or how low the frequency is, the cells detect that kind of frequency. But it's kind of difficult to conceptualize that because even though our range is low, like from about I think 20, 15 to 20,000 that we could pick up on a just general range, you know, like you know, on a low end 10 hertz to so about, like I said, 20 hertz, go up to 20,000. But you got other animals like bats, 20,000 to 100,000 hertz. Well, there's no way that our cells can fire that fast to pick up, so the frequency theory also doesn't work. But then there's something called the uh, the Bowery Principle, I'm not going to ask you to worry too much about that. Bowery Principle, you can read it. But you can kind of perceive this. This is showing you that basal membrane, again, the, the floor where the hair, hair cells sit on, depending upon where on the basal membrane it is, depends upon what kind of frequency it looks at. So where that oval window is, where the bone, First talks to the inner ear, the cochlea. That's where you have uh, old window right here, stiff. It's really stiff. So you have really, really high frequencies that you detect. The further you go away from that old window, the further you go in the snail, it becomes less. Well, it becomes less detected for a certain kinds of frequency. So here about 20,000, the further you go, it's now about what? 500 hertz. 20,000 hertz, 500 hertz. So it's like I'm aware of the memory. I kind of visualize this that if you go to the beach, you get sand on your, uh, on your uh, blanket, you shake the blanket. It's kind of stiff where your hands are, but it's floppy at the ends. Of the blanket. So, can you find where on that blanket or where on that basal membrane the cells are firing? Different kinds of frequencies are being detected. So, that could be what, what's going on here. The last part of hearing is discuss a little bit of anatomy, but really about deafness. So, the auditory cortex. So, See this particular slide. Both ears go to the cochlea. I just talked about the cochlea. Go to the cochlea. On the same side, and from there, it can be processed, go to the opposite side of the brain. In those areas we've already discussed, like the medial zinnicus, so it does for hearing, inferior colicus, so it does for hearing. These are further processing areas they can now go to the opposite side of the brain rather than the ear just going to that one area that is just the one side of the brain. So it gets kind of complex in terms of looking at the structure, but when we speak about deafness, two types of deafness, deafness to recall. One is called nerve conduction deafness. No, one's called nerve deafness, one's called conduction deafness. So conduction or middle ear deafness means those middle ear bones are not vibrating enough so you can't really hear. I don't want to whisper right here and make it really hard for you to understand what I'm trying to say, but if I didn't whisper, if you see the lips moving, you can understand something, but you can't quite hear it. So people need a hearing aid, that's for conductive deafness. So to help fix that hearing aid. Nerve deafness is really in the inner ear because it happens from birth, 
those cells aren't working right, and the person never heard sounds. So deafness cannot really be, nerve deafness can't really be fixed by a hearing aid, but uh, there are some people who've had cochlear implants. Very, very, very expensive surgery. Certainly really uh, challenging because you gotta cut through bone, put that actual cochlea, uh, uh, artificial cochlea into the brain. But co cochlear implants have, have existed. So pretty much that's the part on hearing. Uh, next topic of discussion, we're gonna deal with uh, vestibular mechanisms. Let's discuss vestibular mechanisms. So there's a lot of material to cover in chapter six. So when we say mechanical senses, we're speaking about it in the skin and things on how our body operates to detect warmth, cold, touch, tickle. So essentially, pain. So we'll conclude as we go through this chapter on uh, mechanical senses, smelling, tasting, and, uh, and that'll be it for this. So receptors, again, have to be used to detect things. We said for hearing, air cells, so for vision, photoreceptors, so for touch, multiple receptors. So anytime you think about the ear connected to mechanical sense, we're speaking about being able to rotate your body around and not be dizzy. So vestibular, that's what that pertains to, vestibular sensation. So that part of the ear I told you about, the cochlea, and the bottom part of it, the book discusses that in this chapter and the images show you that the semicircular canals are filled with fluid, like jelly. At the bottom of it, you got these things called the ampulla and the saccula. So these semicircular canals, Sacula, utricle, ampulla, these little bumps at the bottom also have hair cells. And within the hair cells, look at this image here and you blow it up. Cochlea, hair cells, at the very base, you got these organs, these uh, hair cells that are like sitting in jello. And let's say you got this kind of fruit item that has jello and fruit inside it, like cut up peaches. So hair cells are floating that, and those peaches and the fruit are like the octoliths. Octoliths, these are like calcium carbonate crystals inside that help to displace the hair cells. And that's why if they're too displaced, guess what? You can have vertigo. So acute labyrinthitis, that's the technical name for vertigo, where you're really dizzy. So if those hair cells are firing too much, not a good thing, so your mechanical senses are off. So beyond the mechanical senses here, Think about the touch. You have different kinds of receptors, Merkel discs, same corpuscles, across in bulbs. There's a table that shows you that. You can see the images of how they have the skin and show them where they're going to be located. Some are free nerve endings detecting pain. You get a little scratch. Oh, that really hurts. Uh, a bruise, maybe a long throbbing pain. You have different kinds of receptors and pathways that detect that kind of pain. For a uh, summary of the type of, type of functions of those receptors, free nerve endings, uh, Merkel dystrophy endings, you look at the location and what kind of response they have. Like warmth, cold, uh, the vicinity corpuscle, yeah, that's one that they do show an image of. So if you took an onion, cut an onion in half, and have all little circles, that's what the inside of a vicinian corpuscle looks like. So any displacement on the outside of, here's the, here's the receptor, any displacement on the outside of it is gonna cause it to feel like something's happening. Like you put your clothes on, you put your clothes on, you feel right there, later in the day you don't feel that because you're adapted to the clothes being on your body. So that's the shape of a Sending more possible things like an onion shape. 
barbers and they go to the body part and say, oh, I feel that on my body at that location. This place is something is pressing on your body. Virgo's disc, again, a uh, different kind of shape, but it may respond to this light touch. Tickling, I mean, sometimes people are more tickled than others. Tickling to certain parts of the body because of sensitivity. So, this word is number 31 here. You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and you have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Spinal nerves. So as they come off the uh, spinal cord, those spinal nerves then go to certain body parts, wherever it is in your body. The places that they go are called dermatomes. Dermatomes. There's a body. It's got different numbers, T3, T4, L4, L5, T5, S1, what does all that relate to? Well, you have different divisions of the spinal cord. Different divisions of the spinal cord. You got your cervical area, C. You got your thoracic area, T. You got your lumbar area, L. You have your sacral area, S. Coxygeal, or coxygeal bone, one C. So you get these different, you get eight cervical, about uh, 12 thoracic, five pairs of lumbar, five sacral, and one pair of coxygeal. coxygeal so you 31 pairs. But those innervate body parts. The places, let me say innervate, the nerve goes to the body. That place is called dermatome. So that's what those numbers mean and the letters. So you just think from wake up and have a pain in your neck, uh, something like a car accident, back's messed up, and they got problems all the way down your leg. Sciatic, that's what we have, that's what we have. That's coming from the dermatome or some problem with the spinal cord, and then the dermatome is connected to you know that part of the spinal cord that's going to the body part. So it's all connected. So speaking of that, with pain, you got pain receptors. Pain receptors, let's say you wanted to look at the surface of the skin. You got these big free nerve endings. No real complex ending to it. They're sensing, like I said, if a nail stuck you right here or a scrape from a knife. Those fibers that go to the body, to the spinal cord, into the brain. Oh, you're sensing that as pain. Here you have a different kind of fiber. There's A fiber, A delta fiber, C fiber. Depending upon the fiber, depends upon how fast it gets to the brain. Also depends upon what kind of pain you actually feel. If you have long throbbing pain or quick piercing pain it's upon the fibers. So pain becomes complex. You, some people can offset pain by thinking about it. Some people can not just think about it. It's not going to work. Got to take medications. So pain uh, research has been pretty Extensive, and we know the whole problem in the world today with drug addiction, and a lot of those drugs are due to people consuming things that are supposed to relieve pain. There's a theory called the gate control theory of pain. It proposes that the spinal cord area receives messages from pain receptors that then go to the brain. From the brain, you have information that can be sent down from the top part of the brain to the spinal cord to kind of shut off that pain. So, gate control. Names to remember. 
Substance P. Substance P is a neurotransmitter that's in the spinal cord that's initiating pain. Constant pain. From the brain, you have things called endorphins that can come down and shut down the substance P. Endorphins. Endo, endo, endogenous, orphans, morphine. Put the word together, your body endogenous morphine. So gate control theory is making reference to that the, the gate, the endorphins that come down and shut those that substance P off, stop that pain. So physically, that's what this is describing. And if it's time, you can go with that figure on your own. It's describing what I just said. Substance P causing the pain in the blue. The endorphins from up above come down, shut that down, stop the pain. So it doesn't continue to go to that body part. Another place right here showing that where in the brain is actually coming from. In that little purple or blue dot there, that's called a periaqueductal ray. Peri meaning around, around what the aqueduct. It's like where the cerebral spinal fluid flows in the middle of the brain. So that area saturated with endorphins sends it down to the spinal cord, shutting off pain. So they say that things like cannabinoids, things in THC, marijuana can help to what relieve pain. Help some people. Uh, capsaicin, if you haven't heard of that, that's what's in red peppers. That's why you eat red pepper and it burns your mouth. Uh, icy hot band aid. Put those things on those pointers on the body. It feels like it's a burning sensation, but it's helping to what reduce that substance P over time. Therefore, you're not feeling the pain at that moment. So you have ways that you can chemically, chemically alter pain. Uh, mentally, guess what? You give a person a sugar pill, a sweet tart, and they might say, "Oh yeah, I don't feel pain anymore." That may be because what you now psychologically, like you know. You're a placebo, and now you can offer that pain by your mind thinking about that. It could be something called stress induced analgesia. Stress. I could stress stop pain. Because under a situation where you're in a life threatening situation, you're not worried about stubbing that toe on the table if you're running or someone's shooting at you or someone's chasing you. You worry about that pain later on. Stress induced analgesia. Perhaps you have not heard the word analgesia, you'll see it in the book, but analgesic, like analgesics, what are those? I don't know. Aspirin. Analgesics are pain reducing medications. So you can now have stress that can reduce that in your own body. Itching, uh, another word beyond substance P, beyond the endorphins, histamines. So antihistamines are used to what stop pain, stop your arterial, your, your, your alveoli and your lungs from expanding too much. So you now have antihistamines, so stopping the inflammation. Well, histamines cause stimulation, which means that may be causing it, it, itching. You may now have maybe say poison ivy or something like that. Moving on, chemical senses. Again, long chapter. So the last part is on. Smelling, tasting, both depend upon chemicals, chemicals that must be coded to detect bitter, sweet smells, uh, uh, danger. So smelling becomes very critical for us and our livelihood. I want you to remember for knowing how the brain processes this, two principles. Label line principle, cross fire pattern principle. The label line really sounds like just one way. So the way the brain codes things. It says a limited range of stimuli goes direct down to the brain. Oh, oh that's, a, that's a rose. Oh, that's orange, citrus. Label line. Versus a cross fire pattern that says a wider range of stimuli contributes to the perception of either. Oh, that rose and that orange, oh, that smells like potpourri. A bunch of sensations and smells. So you have some fibers that can now detect things with wide range, some with small range, and that works both for your what? Smelling and your tasting. You know those two. So for tasting,
you know, on your tongue, you get taste buds, depending upon where the cells are and the tip, sweet. On the back side here, on the sour, uh, salty, pretty much covers a lot of the area on the side, but you got bitter way in the back, the bitter could be dangerous. So, <coughs> two of bitter things. So the taste buds, very complex. They're almost like modified skin cells. Why would I say that? Because your skin cells, epithelial cells, it can burn off, not burn off, it can regrow. That's what ash is, dead skin cells. Well, the same thing can happen with your taste buds. It can burn off. So, taste buds and the receptors are located in taste buds. So, modified skin cells, again, because you can eat that hot food item, burn your mouth, throw your meal at that moment. But later on, those cells will come back in to be tissue food. These receptors are replaced every 10 to 14 days. So, taste buds. Uh, contain about 50 kind of receptors. So again, taste can be very, very detailed. Before we actually communicated by talking, maybe we had to taste things in the environment to know what is and what is not edible, what can kill you, what can what save you. So again, look at the taste buds, you put that on your own tongue, you can see the shapes of a bud, and there the receptors are located. Uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but you have different cultures that consume different kinds of, kind of items. Certain cultures like spicy foods, some cultures drink a lot of milk. Uh, so depending upon the region of people, where people are from, impacts how their uh, mechanisms, taste mechanisms may develop. That's what this is referring to. Uh, people refer to a new taste called umami. Umami. It's like a, like a meat. Meat kind of taste. So, down the sour, sweet, uh, bitter, salty, people say your mommy's got a taste. So, in the midst of the tasting, yes, it has to get from the tongue to the brain. There's some complex terms about where it goes into the middle part, where the medulla is, and your vital functions. The nucleus of the solitary tract was a very important chemical, very important area, but too detailed to go over at this moment. But you'll see the images in the book and uh, the slide that just shows where it is. Yeah, right here. So, taste, tongue, medulla, medulla area, nucleus of the solitary tract, then it's processed further to the brain. You got to determine. Sensation of the food, and then actually, oh, I had that before. That's a that was a smoothie, fruit smoothie. You know, so your brain now further interprets what's coming from the tongue to the brain, and the brain for the process. So these other areas are very important for this further processing of smelling and teeth. Of course, there's some animals that are more keen to smell than others. And their systems are more uh, sensitive. Again, you look at the uh, images about where it is that certain people have different kinds of uh, sensitivities to consuming certain kinds of foods. Smelling, same scenario, different structure, same scenario in terms of coating. Smelling. Molecules in the air exist. Go up the nose. You got little cilia that, that, that kind of have hair cells that grab onto the molecule and then it goes to the brain to detect what you smell. So here's a petunia, or what kind of flower. It goes up the nasal passage. You blow this up with the hair cells, 
that's those nerves, the olfactory nerves that affect the brain. If you get the little hair cells that exist down to the receptors, it latch onto the molecule, then it goes to the brain. That's how that works. Another image showing the same thing. Here's the middle of the the nasal cavity. You can imagine there's a lot of mucus build up. You really can't smell because the molecules can't get to the mucus. So when it's cold, you really can't what? Smell, you really can't taste. What's interesting with this COVID-19 and this problem with coronavirus, it destroys some of these cells. Whole other discussion, we can talk about that later on. What we're saying here is that anything that messes up the smell also messes up the taste. The molecule here will be latched onto the hair cells, blow this up, same thing right here. With the hair cells, that's all bone going into the nerve, and then goes to the brain for processing. Same thing we're talking about with the taste and the tongue, nose, and those receptors. And again, this, the physical stimulus here is, is the molecules in there. So, smelling is very important for lower animals. Uh, actually, in hamsters, uh, rodents, they have some kind of bromoral nasal organ that's deeply involved in detecting other animals and the pheromones of other animals. Key word will conclude on this chapter pheromones. So, do humans have chemicals that impact? Other humans. So there are protein, the shapes of these receptors that are detecting different kinds of molecules. Those proteins can have different shapes, but it's usually a seven transmembrane structure. Why would we say seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the membrane right there in blue and purple. The receptor is this particular membrane with these particular uh, sequences of amino acids that make it receptive to a particular kind of smell, a particular kind of odor. So the receptors become key and critical. So certain pheromones may latch onto a certain kind of receptor with this kind of shape. So pheromones, last thing to talk about. That's the vomeral nasal organ, vomeral nasal organ I was telling you about from some animals that is used to detect pheromones. It was a pheromone. It's a chemical released by an animal to affect another animal of the same species. So when animals in estrus animals in heat. Cats and dogs may know that the other animal is ready for reproduction, uh, mating. So that's what estrus and going into heat is. Pheromone being released from one animal causing another animal because they don't have cell phones, they can't call them another day. Ready to make babies? No. It's smelling out there. The, the chemicals in the environment make the animal they want to make. But does that happen to humans? Well, we know that chemicals do have an impact because we know that there's a whole perfume cologne industry related to this. So, in conclusion, uh, related to this whole issue of sensation and perception, we talked about there's some people that may be able to hear certain sounds, that's normal, but maybe to put those sounds to colors. Hmm or be able to smell certain colors. Well, synesthesia explains what that may be. And so, again, it could be a genetic issue. Won't matter necessarily say abnormal, but a person can have heightened senses. So again, as we look at other sensory systems, uh, this is the last part of that, okay?